Good afternoon, racing fans. It is a beautiful day for automobile racing up here for the latest top of the O&M Continental 5000 Championship. Much activity going on throughout the paddock here this afternoon. Final preparations being made on the race cars. All the practicing is over, but uh, there's no such thing as a complete racing car. You know, it's always uh, still being worked on. It's up to the starting grid, and many is the time that uh, mechanics have been working on their race cars when they come to the starting grid. But very shortly now, the drivers will be attending the driver's meeting and bringing the cars out for this uh, 12th installment in the L&M Continental 5000 Championship. Anyone that is not maintaining a reasonable competitive speed during the, the event may be brought in. From England they come, from Quebec, from Ontario, from Florida, and Texas. These are the men who list their profession as racing driver. Mark Donahue, Media, Pennsylvania. George Former, Arcadia, California. John Cannon, Montreal, Canada. Ron Grable, Cupertino, California. They will test their skills today. And those of 20 other men in a sport of speed and courage. Okay, we've just gotten a word that the car's being called to the grid. Being brought up in their nice orderly rows of two. This could be Lime Rock, Mid-Ohio, Mossport, or Elkhart Lake. It could be Sebring, Laguna Seca, or Riverside. Great names, great racetracks. All lead to the L&M Championship Trophy for Formula 5000 racing cars. Uh, all of you racers that uh, don't have your cars on the grid yet, you've only got a few more seconds in which to do it. Sitting in the pole position from Edinburgh, England, is David Hobb in the Surgy TS5A Chevrolet. John Cannon of Montreal, Quebec in the Hogan Star McLaren Chevrolet. Car number 18, that's George Fulmer, Lotus 70, powered by a Boss 302 Ford Mustang. In automobile racing fans. Mark Donahue in the Roger Penske Sunoco Lola Chevrolet. Ron Grable of Cupertino, California, who had very serious troubles with her. in their tires and test their suspension, suppressing the illusion that in seconds, these men will hurtle headlong for 100 miles at speeds up to 180 miles per hour. Why do they do it? They do it because they love it. It rewards them with life and a living. Formula 5000, built to rules set by the Sports Car Club of America, which limits engine displacement to 5,000 cubic centimeters. They move only 1,300 pounds of car with more than 450 horsepower. They look like Indianapolis cars, but they're allergic to ovals. Formula 5000 cars race on road courses with all the evil twists of a Rocky Mountain detour. Eagles, 
Lotuses, McLarens, Lolas. The names are strange and the sticker price is high, very high. Money must be spent to make money racing Formula 5000 cars. As much as $150,000 a year. Ron Grable's team manages for less than that. Initial investment of approximately $15,000 for a car. Uh, you need a very absolute minimum of two engines at roughly $7,000 each. And probably you should have a third engine to do the job right. You have to have equipment to run. For instance, you have to have a truck, trailer, a method of getting around to the racetrack. So those things are also additional. We had a, almost a financial disaster in our first race of the year. And we had a mechanical failure on the car, which caused an accident and uh, totally destroyed the chassis or the tub uh, of the race car. The replacement value on the tub alone was uh, $5,000 because the initial investment required uh, the order of $50,000 and the continuing expenses to race, uh, our team's expenses have been running approximately $1,000 a race, which includes the basic maintenance on the car, uh, travel for the group chief and his mechanic, so there's another uh, $12,000 at a minimum required for the year. So you're talking about a yearly investment do the series somewhere around hundred thousand dollars. That kind of money means a total commitment that challenges part-time professionals like Canada's Bill Brack. When I started racing I wanted to be a professional driver I suppose like everyone else did but um, I think um, uh, things have changed so much in uh, my business and things that uh, I just don't have time to spend at it and I think today uh, to be a top driver requires a, a you to go to the track almost every day of the week and be in a car every time possible with all through the season as soon as you even miss one weekend of racing um, you find yourself behind the field i'm more or less a professional amateur you might say i'm not uh, an a professional and i guess i'm a little bit beyond the amateur stage i'm a professional race driver i, I do it for a living you know, i run every weekend all summer long i'll run 30 to 40 races a year I do it only because I like to do it, not uh, because I have to. Uh, but because I do it as a profession, I look, I look for the, uh, the fortune end of it too, but the two definitely go hand in hand. There's only one, one way a guy can be successful, uh, if he has the fame, he gets the fortune. I motor race for the sheer joy of motor racing. Personally, I have to get paid for it, but otherwise I wouldn't be able to support myself. The days of it being a sport are uh, are gone. At least for me, they're gone forever. And uh, uh, although the, the the days when it was a sport was was a wonderful time, really very very enjoyable. But now it is a business, and and we depend on our successes in racing to continue for the next year.
competition is so fierce in this most exciting version of auto racing, this quest for the North American Road Racing Championship, there is no timeout, no break between sets. The level of concentration and exertion, not physical, but mental exertion required in the car for an hour or two hours or whatever the race length is, is, is just phenomenal and can't be appreciated unless you do it. Concentration begins well before race day. Garages all over town are filled with unusual cars and conversation the night before a Formula 5000 race. Uh, 2035, right? Yeah. yeah. So we want to go to 1936 in second. That means we're going to have to move third, fourth, and fifth now. Uh, what do you think uh, about uh, buzzing the engine? With well, we got two things we can do with fifth. Uh, we're going to have to go to 26, 29, fifth. I'd like to put a little bit of flap on the back of the wing. Since, uh, We've only got this one straightaway here, and the speeds are fairly low. We're only around 170 mile an hour. So we can use the additional lift from a little bit of flap on the back of the wing. Uh, I think we're a little low on the right height and probably a little high in the front. So if we raise the rear up and drop the front, we'll get some additional camber. so fast and react so quickly that the driver must stretch his nervous system, making man and car into one. Driving one is like controlling a never-ending emergency. L&M champion John Cannon finds them quite unlike your normal car. I've actually driven a race car on the road in Nassau. I was allowed to drive one of the cars from the boat and to the race and track. And that's when I first realized that uh, a race car on a, on a road is just unbelievable. And there's no way that you can relate road racing really to driving on the road and this is something like really million. The performance of the car is something that nobody would have any idea uh, that it could be that quick, you know. And I would say that nearly every person that I've ever seen who thinks they're a good road driver, that uh, they wouldn't even have time to think in a race car. I think that the best way to describe a race car as opposed to passenger car is uh, from the uh, standpoint of how the driver or the passenger would feel inside that car. Most passenger cars don't operate at the maximum cornering capability on an every uh, turn basis. But uh, when they do, of course, why it's quite violent inside the, uh, inside the car. And uh, a race car is, is roughly double that violence uh, all the time, every turn, accelerating, braking, and cornering. And, uh, uh, it, the race car, of course, is built to do this, it, and a passenger car is not. So when a passenger car is, is at the maximum way, it's, it's leaning a great deal, and the tires are rolling under and squealing, and it's on the verge of being out of control, whereas a race car is very controllable at twice, roughly twice that load. Most people have had experience on slick roads, like ice or snow, and it's very, very much like that, uh, except that your speed is phenomenally high. and. Uh, you have to drive the car really not by feeling what it's doing, but by anticipating what it's going to do, you know. It's, you've got to be really way ahead of the car, and I think you just have to drive it by anticipation. Like, especially here, we've got a spot where the car goes very light into the air, and you have to distinctly start to correct for what it's going to do before you get there, because you're turning and going over a thing at the same time. So you start to point the steering wheel into the slide before it ever happens. Formula 5000 drivers are strapped tight into their form-fitting seats. At first glance, only the steering wheel looks familiar. You've got 
two switches. One is the ignition switch. Uh, we have one other switch in the cockpit, which is this big one. This is a gear shift lever. It's a five-speed transmission. It's a standard H pattern, with the exception of uh, first and reverse. The standard H is second, third, fourth, and fifth. Uh, an H lying down on the side, and then reverse and first are down below the H. The uh, first gauge around here is uh, oil pressure. The center instrument is the tachometer. Uh, zero to ten, ten thousand. Uh, our normal rev range is, uh, our normal shift points are somewhere around eight, depending on the engine builder. Uh, the instrument to the left of that is the water temperature gauge. The dials on the gauges are arranged so that when everything is operating normally, the dials or the needles on the dials are straight up and down, so that you immediately notice one that's out of sync with the rest of them, and you notice something wrong. The car moving through traffic very, very nicely now. Ron Grable going into the pitch, the car down on the left side. Don't see what the problem is. There it is. He's got a flat left rear tire, and that means it puts him in big trouble because this race is about half over, and he's got about 70 miles to go, and he could be in big, big trouble. John Cannon has just gone by, taking over second place, and uh, the whole host of cars going by, so Ron Grable is in deep trouble. And there he goes, charging out of the pitch, well back in the back, and he's got some kind of motor racing. For racers like Ron Grable, the experience of putting together a fast lap never loses its appeal. Racing is dangerous, and uh, we all have to uh, uh, face up to this fact. Uh, I think that a driver who who gets hurt racing is uh, that's a lot less tragic uh, scene than um, a guy that's driving down the highway and gets hurt because a tractor trailer jumps the center aisle and, and runs into him head on. Uh, a race driver realizes that it's dangerous and conducts himself accordingly. But the fellow that driving down the highway, he doesn't. Uh, doesn't know that it's dangerous, doesn't want it to be dangerous, and if it was, he'd probably pull off to the side. And that's the big difference between racing and, and driving down the highway. There's equal accidents uh, in both in both circumstances, but uh, with racing, I think everybody's aware of it and accepts it, and nobody's really very upset if something does happen to somebody. Whenever you get in a race car, there's the responsibility that there's, a, there's danger involved, and uh, uh, I know none of us want to get hurt. 
like to do everything we can to avoid it. So uh, we accept the danger and uh, try to be as careful as possible and uh, not, not make any of these uh, dreadful mistakes. I think you're really aware of it when something um, goes wrong with the car beyond your control, like you feel something is broken and you feel that it's going to go off the road and there's nothing you can do about it, of course you immediately think of, wow, something obviously might happen to me. That's what racing drivers casually call a moment. The slightest error can spell disaster. Strong wills force them back into the cockpit again. For each driver cannot always win. Bad luck for Ron Grable, but boy, it sure does make the pressure on the road. Looks like Kurt Reinhold is going by now. That red and white one. After the tension of today's race, the winner's circle is sudden relief, complete relaxation. It's the pot of L&M gold at the end of the racing rainbow. successes in racing to continue for the next year. I motor race, but she enjoy motor racing best. I have to get paid for it, but otherwise I wouldn't be able to support myself. I do it only because I like to do it. Not, uh, not because I have to. But because I do it as a profession, I look, I look for the, uh, the fortune in it too. For these professional athletes, these Formula 5000 racers, the winner's circle is the end of one road and the beginning of another the road to the next race.